we have a coin is flipped and a die is rolled. How many different possible outcomes can occur? Let's look at this word outcomes first. So when we talk about an outcome, so we're talking about one event that can occur when these things happen. So a coin is flipped and a die is rolled. One possible outcome is we could get a heads on the coin and we could get the number two when we roll the six-sided die. Another possible outcome is we could get a tails when we flip the coin and we could get a five when we roll the die. So how many different outcomes could occur when we flip a coin and roll a die? Well, let's look at solving these uh, with some visual strategies. So one possibility is an area model. The way an area model works is we consider how many outcomes there are on the coin. So a coin could have an outcome of heads or tails. And we consider how many outcomes there are on the die. So presuming a six-sided die, it could be a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And what we do is we draw a grid or a matrix. And we can see that each cell in this matrix will correspond to one possible outcome. So this cell would be if I got a heads when I flipped the coin and rolled a one on the die. The one to the right of it would be if I got a heads when I flipped the coin and rolled a two on the die. So it could be heads three, four, five, six, or tails one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, so how many outcomes? Well, if we count up how many cells there are in this matrix, we have 12 possible outcomes. So that's one strategy we could have used to solve it. Another strategy would be a tree diagram. So for a tree diagram, we would first flip the coin. So if we flip a coin, we could get a heads or we could get a tails. And then we're going to roll the die. So if we received a heads when we flip the first coin, then on the die, we could get a one or a two or a three or a four or a five or a six. So these are all different possible outcomes after we flip the heads. If we flip a tails instead, and then we roll the die, well, we still have all of those possible outcomes for rolling the die. So we could get a one, two, three, four, five, or six. And at this point in time, we can just count how many outcomes there are. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So using that strategy, we would also get twelve outcomes. Now, it's not always practical to draw a diagram if we're dealing with a large number of possible outcomes. So perhaps I had a 20-sided die and a 12-sided die. Well, that would require a very large tree diagram or a very large area model. So it would be helpful in order to determine a quick way to figure out that this was 12 outcomes without having to draw the diagrams. Well, looking at the area model, we had six possible outcomes that could occur when we roll the die. And we had two possible outcomes that could occur when we flip the coin. And if we multiply those two numbers, six times two, we get 10. And we can see that on the tree diagram as well. So there were two branches for our first choice. And then our second choice had six branches. And again, we multiply those two numbers together, 2 times 6, and we also end up with 12. So instead of drawing these diagrams, we could have just looked at two possible outcomes when we flip the coin, heads or tails, six possible outcomes when we roll the die, and if we do 2 times 6, we end up with 12. So that extends to a very useful concept, which is called the fundamental counting principle. And we use this when we want to count up all of the different possible outcomes in a counting problem. So there's that word again, outcomes. So the way it works is if we have A ways to perform one task, and A is a variable, so that could be 2, 3, 4, 10, whatever. And we have B ways to perform another task. 
then there's A times B ways to perform both of those tasks. So let's just look at this problem. A restaurant serves three different appetizers, five different entrees, two different desserts. How many different full course meals could be ordered? So full course meal would contain one appetizer, one entree, and one dessert. Well, we have three different appetizers, so that's three choices for the appetizer. We have five different entrees, so that's five choices for the entree. And we have two different desserts, that's two different choices for the desserts. 3 times 5 times 2 is 30. So we have 30 different full course meals that could be served, which contain one appetizer, one entree, and one dessert. So to figure out how many ways there are serving one of each of those, we just count up how many different outcomes there are for each one, and then multiply those things together. Here's a problem that will have many more outcomes. So we have license plates in Nova Scotia, Canada. They start with three letters followed by three numbers. So for example, A, B, C, one, two, three. How many different license plates could be printed? Now, you can imagine that this would be a very large tree diagram. Not practical to solve using that method, but we have our fundamental counting principle. So we should be able to solve this by using the fundamental counting principle and just multiplying some possibilities together. So we have three letters. So if we're looking at letters in the English alphabet, we would have 26 choices for each of those letters. So we have 26 choices for the first letter, 26 choices for the second, and 26 choices for the third. And then we have numbers. So how many numbers could we choose? We could have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or zero, which would give us 10 possible choices. So we have 10 choice for the first number, 10 for the second, and 10 for the third. So if we multiply all of these together, that will tell us how many different license plates could be printed. And I had 17,576,000 different license plates, which could be printed using this scheme. And Nova Scotia isn't the only place that uses this. There's many places that use three numbers followed by three letters. All right, B says how many different license plates could be printed if letters and numbers were not allowed to repeat. So ABC123 would be okay, but AAA123 would not be okay in this scheme. We're not allowed repeated letters or repeated numbers. Well, we have 26 choices for the first letter. After we've chosen that letter, we can't choose that again. We have to pick a different one. So we have to pick any of the remaining 25 letters. And now after we've chosen a different letter, that's two letters that have been removed from the pool. So there are now 24 letters that remain to be chosen for the third one. Now we're going to do the same thing with the numbers. We have 10 numbers that could be picked for the first choice. After we've chosen one of those numbers, there are only nine that can be chosen for the second choice. And then there are eight that can be chosen for the third. This scheme gets us significantly less. I got 11,232,000. So it's interesting that even with such a small restriction of no repeats, we get significantly less choices, almost 6 million less possible choices just by not allowing repetitions. All right, final problem. We have a test that contains five true and false questions, so you could choose either true or false for the answer, and five multiple choice questions. So we have four responses for each question, A, B, C, or D. A student randomly guesses at every question. So they've placed an answer for every question, and it was a random guess. How many different ways could they fill out this test? So for example, they could randomly guess true, true, false, false, true, B, A, B, D, D. So that's one possibility, but that's only one of the possibilities for this test. They randomly guessed for every possible question, so how many different possible outcomes are there? 
Well, what we want to do is look at each choice the student has to make and look at how many outcomes there are for those choice. So for the first true or false question, they could have chosen either true or false. So there are two choices that they could have made for that question. And then for the second true or false, there are another two choices. And then two choices for the third, fourth, and fifth true or false question. Now when we get to the multiple choice where we have four possible outcomes, A, B, C, or D, they could have four choices for each of those. So those are all of the possible outcomes for each of these questions. And what the fundamental counting principle tells us is we're going to take each of those choices and we're going to multiply them all together. So we're going to take these 10 numbers and we're going to multiply them. So 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2, that's 2 to the 5th. So I could have written it like that. Similarly, I could have written this next one as 4 to the power of 5. But we're going to multiply the possibilities for each one of these questions. And that's the fundamental counting principle in action. I received an answer of 32,768. So that's how many ways that this student could fill this test out if they chose randomly. So 32,768 different ways. So that is the fundamental counting principle. It's a very strong idea when it comes to counting methods, and we're going to use that as one of our building blocks to get us towards probability. In our next lesson, we're going to look at factorials.